Hey, today we're going to be talking about Article 200. That deals with our neutral conductor or our ungrounded conductors. If we look at Article 200.4, we can see that you could only use a neutral conductor for the circuit it was intended for. Now that seems like it would be common sense, but you know, I've seen in the field many times where I've had journeymen or even apprentices believe that they all go back to the same place. So what difference does it make? Well, that is true. They all do go back to the same place. The difference that it makes is this, though. If I have two ungrounded conductors connected with one grounded conductor, that would be okay. But let's say for some reason I had another set of two ungrounded conductors or hots that the neutral wire was to get broke somewhere. So I just decided, well, I have a neutral wire in that box, so I'm just going to connect it there. It really shouldn't be a problem because they all go back to the same place. Well, the code says that the neutral conductor is a conductor that will carry current. So now I'm carrying current back on four conductors instead of two conductors that it was intended for. Now I could run into an issue of putting too much amperage through that conductor and causing something to happen to that conductor, which would cause it to short out or to burn up or something. So that's the reason that we can only connect the neutral conductor to the circuits that it was intended for. So how do we identify these neutral conductors? Well, there are two rules. One of the rules is for number six or smaller. The other rule is for number four or larger. They're almost the same rule, but there's just one exception on the number four and larger. The rules that are the same for both of them are they either have to be a white wire, a gray wire, or a colored wire with white stripes, except for a green wire. So if you have a colored wire with white stripes, if you ever find that in a box, that most likely is your neutral conductor. And I believe the code says that it has to be three white stripes. So check that out. For number four or larger, we run with the same three uh, wiring types or identification types. But then we have a, a fourth identification type where we can tape the conductor at every location or junction box that you can see that conductor. So in this example, you see I have a red conductor taped white. And according to code, that is permissible. Let's move on to Article 200.7C1. I've drawn a couple diagrams here. And in Article 200.7C1, this article is an article that talks about circuits over 50 volts. And if you were to use the wiring or your wires for three-way and four-way switches and for single pole switch loops. In this diagram, I have a single pole switch loop. Because it's a loop, I really don't have a neutral conductor going to the switch. If you look at our diagram on the left, this is the wrong way to wire a switch loop and it is completely against code. If you look at these wires that are near this light, these wires would all be inside of the wire or the lighting box. So I have my hot and neutral Romex coming in. And then I have my switch loop wires, which would be a black and a white or a 14-2 Romex coming out. In this example, I've tied my hot wire to the black wire of my switch loop. And I've tied my white wire of my switch loop to the hot side of the switch. I've re-identified the white wire so we know now that it is a wire that carries current back or voltage back to our light. Well, these wires go down into our switch box, and now I could conduct, connect one hot to a screw on the switch, 
I connect my return path back, which that's what this wire is, to the other screw on the switch. Well, the code says that my return path back to the light cannot be the neutral or the white conductor. So even though I re-identified this, this is a wrong scenario. And you can't do it this way. Let's move over to this diagram on the right. And this is the right way to actually put this in. If we have our, our hot and our neutral coming in to our light box, and we run a two-wire Romex out of our light box into our switch box, then we re-identify our white wire, which is code, with black tape, or we can use a marker. We connect it to our hot wire. Our hot then comes down to our switch, goes into the screw of our switch, and then we run the black wire into the other screw of the switch, and it returns the path back or the voltage back to our light on the black wire. Now I have a black wire and a white wire connected to my light, and this is my neutral from the, the power coming in. So if this switch paddle were down, then my light would work. Well, what's the difference? I mean, what, what difference does it really make? Either one of these situations, this light would still come on and still work. And for the most part, it would never cause anybody any problems at all. But here's where it can cause problems. In this scenario on the left, if I take this white wire and I color it with black or I put black tape on it, and the tape were someday to fall off, or that black marker would become faded, and over time it will, and I've seen it where the white wire in the box also kind of turns a grayish color. Well, now you would have two grayish colored wires that would go to this light. If I were to change out this light, how would I know which one is really the neutral? So the code doesn't allow us to do it this way. It requires it to do it this way on the right so that we always have a colored wire connected to the hot side of the light, and we can definitely identify which wire then is the neutral. Now, how does this work in a three-way setup? Well, once again, on the left is our wrong wiring diagram. So in the light, we have the same situation. We have our Romex coming in, which is our hot and our neutral. And we have our two-wire switch loop coming out, which is a hot and a neutral. Well, we've done the same thing. We've ran our hot down. And where this differs is inside of this first box, I have a three wire, a 14-3, going from this first box to the second box. So I have a red and white wire that I connect between the boxes on the three-way screws, which would be our travelers. Now I have a black left over. And when we get into switching diagrams, I'm going to use one rule every time, and that rule is this. To make a three-way work, you have to have a hot on one side and the switch leg on the other. So if you look at this diagram, you have that. You have the hot coming through, connecting to a wire nut, taking the black wire from this three wire right here over to this switch. Now I have my switch leg coming off of this switch right here on the common side, coming back to my light. Once again, I have two white wires connected to my light. Even though I've re-identified this wire, this is my return wire coming back off my switch loop. Once again, according to code, not allowed. If you look at this diagram on the right, you're going to see that I've done it the correct way. All of this stuff down here in these two boxes are the same. The only thing that's different is I brought my hot wire down on the white and re-identified it, connected it to the black wire that would then take the hot over to the three-way switch. And now I have my black wire from my two-wire switch loop coming back, connecting to my light. And that's what gives me the correct uh, way to install this. You may not see this very often, uh, but you may run into it every once in a while. And hopefully from this diagram, you'll remember how this was wired 
uh, so that if you ever have to troubleshoot one in the future, you'll be able to do that. In Article 200.10b, talking about receptacle terminations, maybe you've wondered why on receptacles you have a gold screw and a silver screw. Well, the code requires that we must have uh, two dissimilar colors where we connect our wires to our device. And where we connect our neutral to, that neutral screw must be either white or a similar color to white, which in this case is silver. Or it must be marked with the word white. If you look at this picture here in the center, I'm sure you've probably seen this on GFCIs that you've installed. But they have the word white on the back of the GFCI. I know some of you thought maybe that was to dummy proof the receptacle. But the code in 200.10b requires that to be so that's why this receptacle or this gfci is made this way is so that you know which side to put your white wire on as we move over to this other diagram we have a simple screw shell and in 200.10c it tells us that our grounded conductor or our silver screw must be connected to the screw shell and not to the hot pin and that's why these are all made this way, because we want our neutral conductor to be connected to the shell, not the pin. The pin is harder to get to, and we want what the shell to be hot, to where it would be easy for somebody to get shocked. And 200.11 even gets us into reversing the polarity of our grounded conductor. If you look at this receptacle right here, you'll see that it is a polarized receptacle, which means the neutral hole is larger than the hot hole. And the reason for that is when you have polarized two-prong cords, you can't plug it in the wrong way, which in this case of a lamp would mean you couldn't turn it around so that this screw shell over here would end up being hot because you turned it over. So we don't want to reverse that polarity with the grounded conductor, and that keeps us from doing that. Now let's get into Article 210. Article 210, the scope is important in this one, as it is in all of them, but in this one especially because we deal a lot with branch circuits. And the scope tells us this covers branch circuits except for motors, which are in Article 430. Right underneath the scope, there are is a table for other articles that we could find that deal with branch circuits. And those are going to be 440, for us anyway, Article 440, which talks about air conditioners, and Article 550, which talks about mobile homes, or we might call them trailer homes. So if you're dealing with those branch circuits, you might find other special rules that you need to follow that only apply to those different places or the, that piece of equipment. Now, you've probably always believed that when you look at a wire and the wire size, that you know what that branch circuit is rated for. I got a number eight, must be a 40 amp branch circuit. I got a number 10, must be a 30 amp branch circuit. And for the most part, that is going to be right. But what you're going to find is if I have to use a larger conductor because of voltage drop somewhere, I mean, say you have a outbuilding quite a ways from your house and you want to run a couple circuits out there. Well, sometimes number 12 isn't going to be large enough due to voltage drop to keep that voltage high enough for you to use your equipment out in that garage. So you might have to run um, a number 10 or maybe even a number 8 out there for those circuits. Well, if you connect them to a 15-amp branch circuit, those wires, well, even though they're rated themselves for higher current, that circuit is only rated at whatever you connect it to. So your overcurrent device, which in this case would be your circuit breaker. Those are the things that we need to understand. We talked in the last class about a website that I found where 
a guy had finished his basement, and he used the example of putting in a 125-amp sub-panel onto his panel and how that he wished he would have had the electrician put in a 200-amp sub-panel. And then he went ahead and said that it's connected to a two-pole 60-amp breaker in his main panel. So does he really have a 125-amp sub-panel? No, because the circuit that supplies it is only 60 amps. So keep that in mind when you start seeing different size conductors connected to smaller breakers. That's probably happening due to some sort of voltage drop, or they just don't want that much power going to where the equipment is at. How about how large of a lighting circuit can you have in your house? How much voltage can you put to a light? Can I get a 240 volt metal halide light and stick it inside? Well, the code says that there are voltage limits in 210.6 for lights inside of a dwelling unit. And the, the line side of that light can only be 120 volts. Now, the exception is for ballasted fixtures. If you have a ballasted fixture, the, the load side of that, that ballast or that transformer in that fixture is going to be higher voltage. And according to code, that's okay. But your input side of your ballast cannot be more than 120 volts or any light that you put in your house. The code also addresses if I have multiple branch circuits on one device. Well, I, I've seen that before, and you can have that. So if you have two circuits on one device yoke, which on a duplex receptacle, you would have one device yoke. And I have the scenario in my garage. For my electric car, I ran out a number 10. Let's see, what was it? It was a number 10-3 with ground. So I could have enough ampacity out there to plug in if I decided to get a larger uh, 240 volt charger for my car, which I'd never done. But I did put in a duplex receptacle. I broke the tab on the side, and then I put one circuit per, per, rece or per receptacle on that duplex device. In the panel, I have a 20 amp two pole breaker because the code says I, I have to do that or I have to put a handle tie on the two single pole breakers that would be out there. And the code says that I have to have a simultaneous disconnecting means. It requires that so that you don't get hurt on the neutral side. Because if I turn off the first circuit and I have a load on the second circuit and I was to take the neutral off of that device, I would now become uh, the conductor if I were to touch that in something else that was grounded or bonded, which would just shock me like you've never been shocked before. And here's the thing, because you don't have the handle tie on there, you don't know that something down line might be on. And that's why they require it. I mean, they're requiring it for life safety to keep people and equipment from uh, getting damaged. Let's get into GFCIs. Article 10.210.8. This one is an article about GFCIs for personnel. Now, don't mistake that as the same GFCI for equipment. You know, personnel GFCIs strip it between 3 to 5 milliamps, where equipment GFCIs don't trip until they get to about 20 milliamps. We can be killed off of 0.2 milliamps. So uh, even the GFCI uh, tripping at 3 to 5 may not be enough to save everybody, but it'll save most. Keep that in mind when you're looking at, at GFCIs because they make them both ways. Make sure you get the right one. But a GFCI must be installed in a readily accessible location. Well, a readily accessible location is you have to be able to walk up to it, touch it, not have to remove anything else. I had an instance in my parents' house when I wired it 
they decided to put a pantry where they had a cabinet uh, for a kitchen counter. Uh, I had the GFCI there. That's where, you know, it made the most sense to put it. Uh, they put it in the pantry. The inspector made me move the GFCI. I was I was upset because I thought, what difference does it make? Well, it does make a difference. The code says in 210.8, I have to be able to just touch it. I I can't have to move anything out of the way. When you're doing your work, remember that's in the code. That's something you have to follow. And then 210.88 lets us know where we have to install GFCIs. In the bathroom, all receptacles have to be GFCI. In garages, all receptacles. And now that even includes the one in your ceiling for your garage door opener. Outdoors, there is an exception. We'll talk about that in a minute. Crawl spaces, if you were to put a receptacle in there. Unfinished basements, every receptacle in your unfinished basement has to be GFCI protected. Except if you have a permanently installed burglar or fire alarm, uh, they don't want you to put that on GFCI protection because those are life safety devices and they don't want your GFCI to trip and you not know it. Now they re require that all receptacles on kitchen counters be GFCI protected. When I got into the trade, it was only within six feet of a sink. And now they require GFCIs within six feet of any sink. And then if you have the pleasure of wiring somebody's boathouse someday for them, every receptacle in there must be GFCI protected. Now let's look at the exception for the outdoor GFCI. If you have an outdoor GFCI, and if you look at my drawing to the right, that is installed only for de-icing or, or uh, ice melting equipment, which uh, this green line represents, uh, say, your gutter de-icing cable and up onto your roof. And that receptacle is, is not readily accessible then you can use a GFCI that's made for equipment so that you don't have nuisance tripping. That's the only exception for outside. But there is an exception. Well, as always, I hope you guys took notes. If you need to go through this again, go ahead and go through it and make sure you take good notes. We'll talk about this more in class. And I will see you next class. And don't forget, as always, to be safe.